see some of the drivers. You know, Graham Hill had got long hair by by that mm. point, but, but Stuart was the, yeah. Stuart was the first kind of I think very calculatingly the first sort of Beatle era mm. driver, mm. wasn't he? You know, Jim Clark always looked like a, a driver of a, of a previous era, but then Stuart mm. came on. Grew his hair, wore the sort of Bob Dylan cap. Yeah, the Elvis yeah, Spectre. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what be later became known as the Elvis Spectre. Elvis gave him those specs, you know. Uh, really? Well, sorry, tell me. I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing is that Jackie's ship was quite was always preoccupied by the weather. I didn't notice that. He kept looking at the sky and said, my God, it's like yeah. a car. I, think, I, think <coughs> I do it, remember that year. It was simply, it was extraordinary. Every day was terrible, and you just thought, well, mm. can't Because it didn't stop the rain in those days, did they? I think anybody no, no. who was about to be unleashed on a street circuit like that in a, in a 460 horsepower Formula One car yeah. would be fairly obsessive about the weather. <laughs> mm. But it's nice to see the old circuit sort of late on, isn't it, where they're still racing along, along before they built the swimming pool. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, with, with the old hairpin at the end. And the, the confined it, it had a lot more yeah. character in those yeah. days. Yeah. Because, and also, that did present really the only, you know, the only proper overtaking opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice um, to be driven around the course. And, of course, there was no chicane before, uh, before Sander Vogt in those days. Sander Vogt was a very quick corner. But I still think, and you may disagree, <laughs> uh, that, that Monaco is a fantastic place to have a motor race. And although it seems absurd now in the era of the, of the kinds of Formula One cars we have today, and I know it's, you know, there, there, there are too many fancy people around and too many sponsors and all that sort of thing. But still, amazingly, it ends up being almost always being a very interesting motor race. You know, you, get, you very often get a surprising John. result. Oh, yeah. You do get yeah, overtaking, no, you get extraordinary yeah. pieces of bravery and luck and all kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. One of the nice things about, uh, about Monaco is the proximity of the scenery mm. to the action. Yeah. to the cars yeah. themselves yeah. Yeah. because yeah. there you get even though they're going relatively considerably slower than they are on any of the artificial circuits mm. you do actually get a tremendous impression of speed yeah. you go up and stand just inside uh, inside the arm <coughs> car at Massenet for instance where they're pulling up oh. the hill there and you see the yeah, it's in the confined space wasn't it interesting it? seeing the old yeah. tunnel yeah. How far around that right? Yes, how much shorter in fact than it is now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it requires the most precision, doesn't it? Because you've got 90 degree curves. It's the last unforgiving circuit. Mm -hmm. Unforgiving. Yeah. yeah. It takes no prisons. No, I mean there are, no. there are no sand traps. So you make a mistake, you're mm -hmm. going to plant a barrier. Yeah. And mm -hmm. break so Jackie a wheel was warning, or you, know, you know, watch out for <laughs> the curbs because they'll take your tyres out. What's yeah, the real yeah, stuff? Yeah, actually, that's like that, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, you, you think oh. the pits are just wide open. Everybody I, I, comes I, around the corner, yeah. a bit skew with. That was the most startling thing of all, I think, to just to remember there were days when there was no barrier between the pit and the, yeah. Yeah. And the track. How the hell have you ever got mechanics yeah. to work in those days? <laughs> they were protected by that yellow line. <laughs> yeah, of that's well. right. <laughs> the other thing you got in that film was a very clear view of, of Jackie Stewart as the first really effective PR man in, in motor racing. Mm. And, you know, mm. so aware of sponsors. Yeah. Signing, the, signing the autograph. Yes, yes. And, 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 and spending time with an with excruciating the sequence with the, 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 the winners of the Daily Express competition. Right. Mm. But well, he was very good to them, wasn't he? He, he was, and I'm in fact, this is... I, 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 this is why I've got so much time for him. That he actually, God knows, you know, how the hell do you do you put up with that? Mm. There was a bit of resistance to, to, to Stewart as a kind of charismatic person, wasn't there, oh, among yeah, among yeah, crowds at the time? I always remember a race of champions at Brands, and I think it must have been about 1970. And Regazzoni was entered in one Ferrari, mm. and Stewart was in the two, I guess. Um, and I remember Stewart leading the race, and, and they, they came along pit straight into paddock. And Regazzoni went by him, and the whole grandstand got up and cheered. Mm -hmm. And that was a Swiss in an Italian car overtaking a Scotsman in a, in a by and large, a British car. And yet the crowd was on I Regazzoni. suppose partly the Ferrari mm. thing. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, but, but, I, but, but also, they were personal personal yes, personality. They, they liked Clay. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there, there was, was a coolness there, there was towards, certainly yeah. an animosity. Yeah. 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 He's very honest in this show, though. I mean, we learn, I learned for the first time, I mean, supposing it had rained, it seems that the Tyrrell was, you know, a bucket of crap in comparison in the wet tumbling over itself. Mm -hmm. So there's an element of luck. Mm -hmm. I mean, the World Championship could have gone somewhere yeah. else that yep. year yeah. had he not won the race, come nowhere. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I'm not sure if it's that year or 72, maybe it's 72, but um, one of those years at, at, at um, Monaco with the Tyrrell, he went to the line and uh, the thing had no rear brakes. And he ran the race with, with no rear brakes. Yeah, rear brakes. Was it 73? It was, and he had absolutely no rear brakes, yeah. you're right. No yeah. rear brakes at all. Well, that, that is an amazing feat of, of, yeah. uh, of race driving. driving. Around that. And he won. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and, and that, um, combined with his performance at Nürburgring when he won the 68 German Grand Prix, um, you know, with, with his wrist in a splint mm -hmm. where he'd broken the scaffold mm -hmm. behind. Uh, 
through the rain and the mist and all, everything else that nature could throw at him. Mm. You know, I, I, I mean, I've got endless admiration for him as a driver for mm. doing that. And that, to my mind, makes up for the other things that he did that I don't particularly like. But, you know, I mean, mm. everybody's mm. got likes and dislikes well, when it comes to a hero. Film. That film does bring him out. It, it's a very human scene now. I mean, having the breakfast in the morning. Yeah, yeah. He's scratching himself there. He's got his knickers on and yeah. Helen's there and uh, Polanski's there. I mean, they're having, what, a bit of egg and bacon. It's all awfully casual. And, and, and forgetting, well, one, forgetting one's vest and then putting it yeah. on. Yeah. Wasn't that interesting? The, yeah, the, 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 the way he got so that. ratty yeah. with that photographer. Mm. Uh, and, and I don't blame him for that mm. because you... You know, I'm so, I, I think any any normal guy, you know, would have been hard yeah. hard pressed not to deck the photographer. You know, asking him to show off the Goodyear sticker or whatever. Mm -hmm. Did he keep yeah. his gold Rolex on for the event? By the way, <laughs> I was kind of <laughs> about that. <laughs> that, that, that that business about taking off his his watch and his rings and so on is it, very very interesting because in '67 I think it was, an aerospace doctor called Dr. Michael Henderson published a book called Motor Racing in Safety. Mm. Really, it was the first voicing of um, uh, findings from a, from a medical man who was a racer himself, who was really seriously looking at the statistics, analysing race accidents, and saying, look, it's better to be strapped into a car with a rollover bar protecting your head um, than it is to be thrown out. You know, it's better to, be, to survive the initial impact still mobile so that you can get yourself away from the fire than to be so grievously injured by the time the fire breaks out that you're going to fry in it anyway because you can't move. Mm. And it was all those sort of t things yeah, in 67, right. 68, mm -hmm. which Jackie latched on to and became part of, uh, of the safety crusade that, that, that he became, you know, the figurehead for. Yeah, clearly because five of his best friends had been killed. And, and I, th I think it's yeah, yeah, his own accident at Star in 66 yes, had a huge effect on him. We did yeah. have safety considerations in the early 60s. I remember my first ever race, I'm on the grid, and the, the uh, chap with the flag came over and said, I say, would you mind removing your collar stud before we start the race? So safety was of yeah. some consideration, but well, well, one of the interesting, <laughs> virtually <laughs> yes, I've been up all night. I think <laughs> Stuart was the only driver in Formula One using belts. Yeah, yeah. sure. Gilling mm. wasn't, you know, yeah. no, no Graham, no, no. Any of them. about the crutch stud to stop him going on. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, yeah. That, that, that was the thing that Jochen would never wear, wasn't that, it? That's right. Right. They, the, the, there was no panic in the, in, the, in the pit garage. The mechanics seemed to be going about their work in a very sort of calm way. I like that, though. Yeah. All, the, all the teams were yeah. clustered together That's in right. the garage. And I also noticed that Stuart's mechanic, whom I remember at the time, Roger, Roger was also yeah, Roger his sort of development yeah. engineer, because <laughs> Stuart's <laughs> chatting to his spanner man about what we might do to him. Well, Derek Gardner wasn't there or something. So that but he wanted the seat there. moving forward, didn't he? Wasn't there, there, Derek? I didn't, I didn't see Derek. No. 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 There was lovely yeah. body language again, though, with Ken, wasn't there, <laughs> after Jackie had won. You yeah. saw Ken turn around again, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like this, you yeah. know. Bonuses, bonuses. Yes, bonuses, bonuses, yeah. yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, that film, in a way, was preaching to the converted, as far as we were concerned, we were fascinated by it. I'm not sure we would have been as fascinated if we were looking at it as contemporary as, as uh, mm. you did, because mm. you found it a bit iffy. But that, that's the way I remembered yeah, it. But when now, I you see, it's it got a historical run. pattern to it. Mm. And it's a, it's a glimpse of a vanished age. Perhaps, well, well, you know, the true perspective of that film now it, it, it is just to admire Stuart for, for in, in just how good he was then, because he was literally light years ahead of almost anybody else in Formula One mm. in terms of, of his handling of, of, mm. of, you know, promotions and the media and mm. so on and so forth. I must say something I've never forgotten. Um, um, do you remember Doug at Donington in 79 when Fangio drove? Mm. And I remember... I was in the pits when Fangio went out in this uh, the 37 Mercedes and he hadn't driven it before and he had it was Neil Corner's car mm. he hadn't driven it before and he hadn't been round Donington before um, and Gurney and Andretti were right behind me and Fangio came out of the uh, chicane on the first lap and sort of prodded it and the thing just went I mean it was just the tail just way way out of line and just for one awful second i thought oh geez, he's going to make a fool of himself you know in front of all these people and in fact i mean he just held yeah. it like that and the foot was down hard yeah. and away he went and i remember mario and uh, and gurney behind me are just sort of whooping like schoolboys you know and yeah. punching the air and it was, yeah. it was just yeah i, mean, I remember 60, I 
68 years old at yeah. that point, yeah. contemporary Grand Prix drivers. The great majority have not the slightest interest in in the sport before they got involved in it. No. Not the slightest. They're not mm. motorcyclists, are they? Many of the others were. No, no, no. But I mean, but they're not even curious. You know, they don't want to know about Jim. No. Jones. That's true of practitioners of all sorts of things. I think. I mean, I think if mm. you go and ask the average young jazz musician, you know, he probably doesn't care about people from 50 years ago. Very the much. They're into well, the, so probably more through osmosis than through admiration, mm. in a way. They're into. I never blame people for being interested in what they're doing and being interested in the moment. You know, we pay to go and watch them and we enjoy the historical <laughs> comparisons, but they're actually doing it, and I don't think they necessarily but have to be saddled with. with but it is a, that is a relatively modern phenomenon. Yeah. Well, uh, I interviewed I mean, Nicky Lauder if you talk some to years ago, Andretti or Eamon, for instance. They'll talk to you all day long about Rosemeyer and yeah. mm -hmm. Caracciolo mm -hmm. because they've read their books. What? And because they're interested. Because they could read. Yeah. No, because, they, because, they, because they could read. And yeah. they, they wanted, they, you know, from being kids, they wanted to know. People well, don't read these days, do no. they? So much I mean, I remember when Eamon said when he first came over here, when he was 19, to be Formula One, part of his problem for a long, long time was that he was completely overawed by the fact that he was racing against his, his god. Hmm. I interviewed Nicky Lauder, for, uh, again, for, for Grandstand some years ago. We, he was at the Villa Desti before um, the, the Monza Grand Prix. And he said, well, you know, I can't think why you bother to race. You don't earn any money. You don't make any money. I think he was German. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? How's the Welsh? <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you are, why you race? You don't make no money. I can't see why you bother, you know. And I said to him, well, do you feel when you race, Nicky, do you have any kind of sense of what's gone on here before you? A Monza's the, one of the greatest all-time Grand Prix circuits. And look at those wonderful drivers and the cars that they drove. And, and it's all crap, he said. I don't <laughs> care for you. On this day, at this time, in this car, only the driver with the quick time. You know, that he was a man of today. 